it's all the points all together in order. You know, so for example, module one, we looked at simply the mind. Now, why would we do that first? This is not traditional in Tibet. And the logic is this, you know, if you hear these teachings in Tibet, because your culture, because your culture, you know, you've, you have an assumption about what the mind is, you've, you've been brought up in Tibet, it's been there for 1200 years, this view, and it's come from India, where it was for a good 2000 years before that, that consciousness or mind is not physical, it's, it's a given, that's the, their culture, it's totally accepted in that culture, it's part of their view. So of course, we, when we hippies first heard these teachings in, um, like I said, the 70s, when we, so those of us who are students of these lamas, for example, then of course you start hearing about the mind and how the mind reincarnates and how the mind has this perfect potential and you keep visualizing the brain, well, you're going to be in trouble, aren't you? We know the brain doesn't go anywhere. It turns into caca when you die. So we've got to understand what Buddha means by the mind. And this is the most radical difference. This one, and therefore the views that come from that, like the law of karma, which will come later, these are all based upon this assumption about the mind coming from the experience of these genius Indians. As His Holiness the Dalai Lama said, it was these Indians more than 3,000 years ago before the Buddha who are the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. That's their expertise. And it's a big shock to us arrogant ones in the West who probably start, thought it started with Mr. Freud, you know? So all of this is understanding the mind. So we need to understand what the mind is in the first, the very beginning. So of course, it's not easy to prove. We don't have a level of mind that's capable of cognizing something called a past life or a future life. But the Buddha is very clear in saying mind does have that potential when you've learned to develop it. So we've got to take, so obviously these views, you can't, if you can't prove something immediately, like if you sit down and you hear that Einstein tells you that E equals MC squared, and you can't even count one plus one is two, then clearly you can't prove it immediately. You've got to be humble and patient and engage in the process of studying and internalizing mathematics and physics. Well, it's exactly the same here. There's no confusion. We get very caught up in knots about this, but how can I believe karma? How can I prove this? How can I prove the mind is not physical blah 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 well how can you prove e equals mc squared you be humble enough to go one step at a time and follow einstein's methodology and you'll either find out one that is right or two that is wrong there's no other option so we have to be patient and humble and engage in it it's exactly the same here you know and as the Dalai Lama says to us people in the west if you can prove that buddha's wrong well you must you must and buddha will be the first to be delighted he, he wants the truth he wants reality you know he's not he doesn't make up all this stuff so this is that's the same approach so we started with saying what the mind is learning about the mind we, that was our first module and then because meditation is something so popular in the modern world and that was our second module because that's what you do with your mind you know meditation is a method series of formal methods where you that you use to transform your mind into this marvelous potential that buddha is telling us that all minds possess So they were the first two. So this third one, and again, this is crucial for us to understand in our culture because it's not our tradition, you know? So it's the presentation of all the points of this path from A to Z, you know? So it's helpful to have the big picture. In fact, in any body of knowledge, you know this is true. In any body of knowledge that you're studying, you have to have the big picture. You've got to know where you're heading. You've got to know where you are, know where you've come from and know where you're going. It's like being on a map. It's exactly the same. But we don't think of spiritual like that. We think of spiritual as hit, hippie, hit and miss, cross your fingers, hope for the best. You know, we're very kind of irrational. So basically then, this packaging of the teachings, I like to call it that, it's a good way to put it. The Tibetans call it, especially since our lineage Lama in the 14th century, because over the centuries in India, maybe now is the time to talk a bit about this. I don't, I know very little about history, I'm so sorry. But I mean, from the time that Buddha first engaged in all the, the current, the prevailing views at the time, you know, back two and a half thousand years ago, he went through that system as far as he could go. and the, the Hindu view too, the Hindu, the, those prevailing Hindu views, they're very similar, exactly the same, looking for the causes of suffering, understanding that the mind has this marvelous potential, letting go of the, of the causes of the grossest level of suffering. They've got methods to let go of the subtler levels of suffering, which is including attachment. But the Buddha's perspective is he got as far as he could go in that system. And he felt that they hadn't gone far enough, that he felt that there hadn't been enough, there's still delusions left in the mind. 
And so he, that's where he diverged in his own direction. And since that time, we have so-called Buddhism. So, of course, that went to all different corners of the planet. First of all, the, the Chinese started coming. I think the Chinese were the first outside of India who started coming to India like fourth and fifth century and not meeting Buddha, obviously, but meeting the Buddhist teachings and, uh, and bringing it back to China. And then Japan after that, and then slowly Tibet, like seventh, eighth century Tibet, and then and most of Asia, most of Asia has been touched by Buddhism, you know, over the centuries. And so Buddhism developed, yeah, from seventh century or so with Padmasambhava, this um, holy being, holy yogi. He, he was the first, I think, I've heard, I mean, I know a little about history, like I told you. Seventh, eighth century, maybe he first went to India, uh, first went to Tibet, he was an Indian. And then slowly, slowly, Buddhism started to develop in India, in Tibet, you know. So then... The teachings that we are discussing here are in the, they're the same in most Tibetan traditions, there's four main tradi Tibetan traditions, but ours is in particular those of Tsongkhapa, our 14th century lineage Lama. Um, so before that time, there are four main sort of so-called traditions, but many sub views of those. They're basically labels given for a certain philosophical approach. So the first lot are called the Nyingmapas, the old tradition. Then you've got the Sakyapas, the, Ke the Kagyupas, and then we've got the Gelugpas. I don't know what even the meaning is in, in, in Sanskrit, in Tibetan, I don't know. That's Tsongkhapa's our lineage Lama. That's since like 14th century. So all the teachings you're hearing in this center and from people like me are through through that lineage, you know, from Tsongkhapa up to the present. So um, the packaging of the teachings, I don't know what this term was coined by Tsongkhapa, I'm not sure, I just don't know that, but it's Lam Rim. So Lam is literally path or road or way and Rim means gradual. Well, it's a kind of cute, a very nice way of putting what you would be engaging in if you decided to become a physicist, if you decided to become a, an architect, if you decided to become a musician or a cook, you enter into a gradual path of study. It's a very good term, but what we'd call it is a course. You say you're doing a course. Oh, yeah, I'm doing a 10-year course. You know immediately what it means. You start at the earlier stuff. You go to the slightly more advanced, and you end up at the most advanced, and then you graduate on this gradual path, grade one, grade two, grade three, as we say in English. So we understand the concept very well, but not when it comes to a spiritual path and not when it comes, especially not when it comes to studying philosophical views. That's really peculiar. I think in our modern world, philosophy is kind of you can delve in at any level at any time and, any, and, and, and study a philosophy. But to think that you'd study philosophy at a, in a gradual way, that stops us in our tracks. Then studying, becoming a spiritual practitioner is gradual. We kind of maybe get that, but we've got many fantasy ideas of what it means. So the contents of this path, this gradual path, the contents of it, what you're trying to study and internalize, the, the body of knowledge, yeah, it's called philosophy. We know that. It's, it's viewpoints. What a philosophy is, is views about how things exist. I mean, you could call that science, you can call it math, the certain areas, but in general, the meaning of life, as we would say, you know. So basically, it's Buddhist philosophy, it's Buddhist psychology, it's Buddhist epistemology. It's, you know, that's what this all the ideas. So they're, what are these then? They're basically Buddha's viewpoints from his own direct experience, not speculation. This is what you've got to understand. You mightn't like what you hear. You don't have to believe it. But what we think of philosophy is clever people kind of have lots of intellectual ideas and then the Socratic approach of, of listening, being very objective, but there's no end to that. We don't have an end goal in, in philosophy, do we? Like with science, maybe, but you don't think you're going to come to a, a conclusion finally and get to see reality. That's Buddha's approach, though, and that's a big shock to us because the Socratic approach is you just listen and you keep your mind open, but there's no end. I mean, I find that profoundly depressing, quite frankly. Like as if you sort of, it's, it's, in other words, it's good, we think it's good in its nature to think about different ideas about how things are. I mean, the only reason to think about how things are is to discover how things are. And this is a shocking thought. Buddha has telling us that he has found from his own experience how things are. Don't have to believe him. Of course we don't. Believing has got nothing to do with it. 
It's like mathematics. Someone's discovered that one plus one is two. What's the point of believing it? Think about this point. It's incredibly important. What is the point of believing it? You know, it would be useful as long as you can rely on people who know it. So, you know, it's fine. But like I say, if you have to go to the market and mummy says, buy me 12 oranges, you have no way to prove what 12 is because you haven't learned mathematics you haven't you haven't proven it to be true so what is it that what what uh, what is this body of knowledge consist of that in this path to enlightenment that we're studying in 14 modules in the discovering buddhism but which is articulated here as one whole piece well it you could it's buddha's views and anybody since the buddha who has taken on board these views and then through their own experience has proved them to be truth, to prove them to be real, has proved them. This is the point. And it's also psychology. So what does that work is the mind. So what internalizes views is the mind. So Buddhism equally has got, an ex as we've been talking all the time, an extensive presentation, a detailed, articulate, precise presentation of what the mind is and how it functions so given that it's your mind that does the internalizing we both need to learn about the mind and the knowledge that the mind is trying to internalize so what's the consequence of all this what's the point of all this this is the point what's the point well as i often say and it's so simple it's almost embarrassing this is articulated perfectly in the word sanskrit word buddha the Tibetan equivalent, Sangye. This tells us exactly the end result of this process of study and practice. And therefore it implies the methodology. So Buddha or Sang in Tibetan, the etymology of it, it, it implies the total eradication from our mind of all misconceptions delusions emotional and misconceptions and the emotional afflictions as they call them so, because buddha has found from his own experience of having done it that all these that the misconceptions and they're not just the emotional ones like anger and depression and anxiety like we talk about but all the but misconceptions about reality when they have been removed from the mind, which implies you've seen reality now and you've removed those misconceptions, that's the first one. That's If you've accomplished that, you have achieved your nirvana, your cessation of suffering and its causes, the first stages of practice. But you can do more. And the, the second syllable, da, implies this. It's the development to perfection of all the positive qualities. So we discuss all this briefly in the first module. This is what Buddha has found. So that is an enlightened mind. When you've accomplished that and become a Buddha, what is your mind? What, what's the point now? Your mind, which is not physical, Buddha says, and if something is not physical, think about it. How can it be confined by space or time or matter? You know. So when you've removed the pollution from your mind, you've removed the misconceptions, you've removed the voices of ego, which Buddha has found do not belong in the mind, are adventitious, are not integral to who we are, are not, are not, um, are not, are not intrinsic to our nature. This is Buddha's outrageous, radical, unique finding. So the consequence of this Buddha having removed the rubbish and developed the goodness of perfection is what? Your mind now, which is not physical, no longer hampered, no longer hindered our mind now is stuck in our body our mind is not physical but it's stuck in the body because we've got all these delusions due to past karma we're locked into this body identifying with this me this world these things very gross very concrete so our minds are still not physical so the process of going through this path from a to z is the unpack is the removing gradually of these delusions and thus the expanding of your consciousness if something were not physical how can it be confined by space or time or matter so therefore your mind when you are enlightened when you have become a buddha the end result of all this work 
your mind will be wherever there is existence as much as you can kind of get your head around that concept if you've been a christian and i used to love this idea when i was a catholic god is everywhere it seems to me over the centuries many similar findings from all the great thinkers and scholars and yogis and meditators and philosophers over the centuries it seems to me so one of them is for example the christians would say and the hindus the muslims example i don't know much about islam though but i think it's the same that they talk christians talk about god god is this all-knowing all-compassionate you know all-pervasive consciousness they don't use the word consciousness energy if you like well buddha would say same he agrees but it's called buddha and everyone can become it the radical difference there is the christians would say that that is one energy and that energy is the, is the boss and that energy is the creator of everything else no concept like that whatsoever in buddhism that's a misconception he says and absolutely he's giving his experiential findings of how we can disprove that not to be argumentative no let people think what they like but he's telling us that's a misconception it's a, it's a deluded view, dualistic still. And that's a whole discussion, you know. So this consciousness of ours, when it's fully developed, the, it, it is, it cognizes that which exists. I gave a talk, I, mean, I often mentioned this, years ago at Melbourne, where I'm from, I was asked at the Catholic University to, to give a talk, 20 minute talk at this conference. And I remember thinking, I didn't know what to talk about until the morning I got there. I looked up the, my dictionary for the definition of God. And it said, three essential qualities infinite wisdom infinite compassion infinite power i thought well that's interesting because they're the three essential qualities of a buddha i mean it seems to me humans have seen many similar things you know have come up with many similar findings but the difference is that we can all become that one and we don't need we don't and it doesn't have the function of, of being a creator we don't need creating we do find creating our own happiness and our own suffering. This is the radical difference in Buddhism about continuity of consciousness, not physical, the law of karma. All of this is where it's different from this Christian view. In the Christian view, there's no creator, there's no boss, there's no punisher, there's no rewarder. We are the boss. We create our own happiness and our own suffering. And this is a fundamentally powerful point in the Buddhist teachings. So when you're a Buddha, you have those qualities. So my talk to the Catholics, I don't know if they liked it, was the similarities between the definition of God and Buddha. I'm not sure if they liked it, but that was my talk. Anyway, you become a Buddha. So your mind pervades wherever, wherever there is existence. You have wis infinite wisdom because you've removed all the delusions. You now see things as they are. There's nothing blinding you any longer. There's nothing any longer separating you from others. So you have infinite empathy and infinite compassion as if everybody were the same as you. And you have infinite power, and this it translates in Buddhist terms, which sounds completely like science fiction, that you've got the effortless ability to manifest your consciousness in trillions of bodies throughout trillions of universes for trillions of eons for the benefit of trillions of sentient beings. That's a Buddha, and the Mahayana Buddhist view says everybody's got that potential. So, of course, this is science fiction. I mean, they'd lock you up if you started to say you're believing in this. You're mentally ill, but this is the Buddha's view. So this presentation of the path, the 14 modules of which present it all, but this one module presents all of the pieces together, the internalizing of these pieces step by step by step, first through listening, then contemplating, and then finally internalizing in the depth of your subtle concentration meditation based upon, and you get insight into all of these, that's when you become a Buddha. You internalize all these these findings and you discover them you 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 find them to be true yourself but as the dalai lama says if you can prove anything from your own experience that you prove a buddha's wrong that's perfect you must say thank you buddha goodbye it's really crucial so just merely believing or merely liking and that's the biggest mistake we make in our culture we confuse liking buddhism with knowing it it's one of the worst mistake mistakes we make you know it's, it's fine to like Buddhism. Buddha's happy, I'm not sure, but it's not going to help you much. Doing it is what helps you, like the math, you know. Liking music is good, you can enjoy it, but you know, you, you, you want to help people with music, you got to learn it. You've got to change yourself, you've got to learn it. So what we're internalizing then, and this is what's presented in these gradual stages through this path, are the different findings of the Buddha about how things are. And each one of these findings is an argument, a, a debate with what the Buddha is saying are the views that we hold now that he says are misconceptions. 
I mean, if you're going to study math, why would your teacher tell you that one plus one is two? I mean, at least there, I mean, if you know, if you, at least there, you don't have any, mis you don't have any conception at all. You just don't know that one plus one is two. But here the Buddha is telling us that everything he's telling us is a discussion, is presenting what he has found to be true, but which is arguing directly with an opposite view that we think is true. And this is the interesting point here. If you, in other words, the, the, the analogy is if you have learned math wrong and you're convinced that one plus one is four, you believe one plus one is four. And, and, and that's why you suffer, because every time you think one plus one is four and you end up with only two, you're always going to be disappointed because you have wrong views in your mind. It's not being fundamentalist. It's just not correct. So it's like we've learned math all wrong. So everything Buddha is telling us, for example, his teachings about impermanence. Why would he tell us that everything is impermanent? If we knew it already, we'd tell him to shut up and mind his own business. We already know that, mate. No, but we don't know it. We think the exact opposite. That's why we suffer. We don't have any view about karma and cause and effect, and our own consciousness creates our own happiness and suffering. We think everybody else causes it. That's why we suffer. Because of the final view of an ego grasping that has a separate sense of me and you, that, which is incorrect, that's why we suffer. So we have all these where minds are riddled with misconceptions. This is why we suffer. So one way of framing all of the Buddha's path is as a system for getting rid of suffering and getting happy. Another way of presenting it, which comes to the same thing, is getting rid of ignorance and getting wisdom. And this is Buddha's point. The extent to which we are caught up in misconceptions about the universe is the extent to which we suffer. So the methodology for getting rid of suffering and getting happiness is to get wisdom, which means that we have our minds to be in sync with how things exist. This is a different part. This is the point for the Buddha about philosophy. It's not everybody can think about everything and all discuss with each other. It's wonderful. But if it's just kind of in your head, it stays in your head and you just think, oh, isn't that a marvelous view? Oh, that's a lovely view over there. What good is that? You're open-minded, you're being very Socratic, but if it doesn't lead you to somewhere, it's like a nightmare. What's the point? The only reason to think about how things exist is because right now we've got misconceptions about how things exist, so therefore we bump into unreality and that's why we suffer. Across the board, this is what Buddha's saying. So we believe things are permanent. We don't think things are permanent. We know things change, but because of ego and Buddha unpacks it all, we have to learn it. We've got this deeply ingrained misconception that everything doesn't change and we can't stand things to change. So we bump into reality every day. So that's why we suffer. We don't have any view of cause and effect. It's a very unusual view, you know, that, that you create your own suffering and your own reality over many lifetimes. I mean, that's a, that's a really brand new idea for us materialists. It's a shocking view. So the Buddha's telling us this is what he's found to be true. So we suffer because we think the boyfriend's the cause of suffering or the mother is the cause of suffering or that money is the cause of my happiness. We put the wrong, we've got the misconceptions about what happiness is. We have misconceptions about what suffering is and what its causes are. This is what Buddha's telling us. We don't have to believe a word he says. So the only way to prove he is true, therefore get the direct experience of being blissful and beyond suffering, which is the result, is by doing it. And you can't rush it. You can't prove E equals MC square overnight. You've got to be humble and patient. You go one step at a time and tick the boxes as you go. So the first step in proving that E equals MC squared is learn that one plus one is two. You prove that. Oh, I proved so far. Next step. Next step, keep going. Gradual path. So, of course, in this system, as we progress, there are many marvelous techniques, meditation techniques, as we've been discussing, that are much more sophisticated and much more powerful that can be shortcuts to get to the true nature of things. Absolutely, of course there are. But that already implies you've done the work in a past life. I mean, you know, for example, one of Lama Zobarimache's students, but also his teacher, this Khandrala, we call it. There's a general term in Tibetan for female Lamas, Khandra, they call it. Like, 
I don't, I don't even know what it means, sky goer or something. So one of them says students, but she's also his teacher. He said in, in the in Copan course when I was there in 2019, he said, my first lady Lama it was so sweet. I've got about 100 Lamas and she's his first female Lama. But she, as she, I mean, as Rumashe said, she was born fully developed, didn't even have to study a thing because it was totally fully developed because she's done the work in the past, you know. So we come into this life and so advanced practitioners can be from a very young age can be advanced because you've done the work in the past because you don't start fresh in your mother's womb you bring with you what you've done in the past the good and the bad you know so the way these philosophical views are presented is in this orderly way according to our capacity to internalize them so in other words the more easy views are first, the more subtle are next, and the most subtle come last. Like any body of knowledge, nothing surprising. But on the face of it, it doesn't seem like that to us. So when we look at Buddhist teachings, you see the word karma, emptiness, bodhicitta, compassion, wisdom, cause and effect, refuge. We give them all equal status as can being Buddha's views. We sort of lump them all together, but they fit into this system. They fit into this, into this gradual path. And this is the key thing. When we get a sense of the big picture, this really helps. Like anything, you know, if you know where you're going, if you're in grade six of music, you know where you're heading. If you don't know where you're heading, you're in big trouble. If you don't know where you're heading when you're studying math or science, you're in big trouble. You just kind of plod along, you know, you've got to have a big picture. Same here. So the terminology they use for these stages within this Lam Rim, you know, the Tibetan as Lama Zoba, in honoring the lineage, as he would put it, the first level of practices and teachings, teachings, uh, the teachings and practices suitable to the disciple of the least capability, they call it. Well, that's a big mouthful, isn't it? Sometimes you see it referred to as the lowest scope for the disciples of the, le of the least scope, scope, you know, within your mind. Well, you know, I mean, I'm cliched, I call it junior school. I only say that because we get that instantly. Oh, I see, that's the first stuff. Oh, I get it, okay. Then you've got the middle capability. Then you have the great capability. Oh, well, I like to call it junior school, high school, and university. It's just my cliche. My, it's very kind of cliche, but it's helpful, in my mind, helpful. As you'll see in those uh, course notes you've got for this module, which is actually this, this, it is this module that I taught at Land of Medicine Buddha in 2005. It's the transcript of that module. So all the time I'm referring to junior school, high school, because it just gives you the reference point of where you're at, you know? And where you're going. Then, of course, you've got the most advanced level, which is mainly only practice in Tibet, the most sophisticated level of philosophy and psychology, which is called Vajrayana or Tantrayana or Mantrayana, Tantra. And that I'd call that postgraduate. Why not? You know, it helps the mind. So as I've got it also in those course notes, the essence, there's different ways of presenting. So, okay, no, no, another way to, sorry, start again. If we look at this lamb rim, this presentation, what's, where does it all come from? What is it? Well, basically, Tsongkhapa, our lineage lamb in the 14th century, took from all the body of vast philosophical body of knowledge and studied in depth in the great Tibetan monastic university system, which comes directly from the great Nalanda tradition in India around the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th century. Complete continuity, unbroken, you know. This, I mean, they study often in those monasteries, they study all this stuff in depth, 20, 30 years sometimes. And then go off, some of them go directly into meditation then and then internalize it for the next 20 years. Some go off and teach it. So basically the Lam Rim is... A Tsongkhapa took, and this actually Tsongkhapa's uh, lamb rim is based upon this little text written by Atisha in the 11th century in, in an Indian who was, who was a great scholar from Nalanda, spent many years in Sumatra with his guru Sir Lingpa, and he, he, he then eventually went to Tibet and spent the last 15, 17 years of his life or something there. So he was the one when he got to Tibet Dharma, Buddhism had been there flourishing for several hundred years, but he kind of felt they'd lost the plot a bit. There's a tantra over here in all the different areas, but there was no coherent view of how everything fit together, was his view, I think. So he wrote this little text, lamp that light, you know, these nice little phrases, the light that guides you on your way. And it is the essence, it's the bullet points, really. And what he did, he took the essential points from this vast body of knowledge 
and presented them in an orderly way, orderly according, like any body of knowledge, to the capacity of the disciple. And, and it's an experiential approach to it. It's, it has to be experiential. You can study, and this is one of the biggest things, like Lama Yeshi, when he first met Western people back in the 70s, the hippies and things, you know, he could see immediately that we were super, super educated. I mean, many Tibetans, even back then, they didn't, if you, only if you went to the monasteries, did you learn to write? And you didn't often even learn to write. They could read, they can memorize everything, but we, they, but look at us how we're super educated, you know? Super educated, technologically very brilliant. And the biggest obstacle, Lama could see this, in our culture is we can have incredible capacity for, for philosophical knowledge, intellectual knowledge, technological knowledge, but it, when it doesn't touch the heart, this is our biggest stumbling block. And I think that's a really powerful point I like to make. We're talking here, for example, in Buddhism about getting wisdom. All the time they talk about wisdom. Wisdom technically means just quitting ignorance. If you say one plus one is two, well, honey, that's wisdom. So we're talking levels of wisdom, obviously. But the interesting point is this. I often make this point. You can be an absolute genius. We know that. You can be the best in your field, have a head full of incredible knowledge, you know, scientific, musical, whatever you like. You can be a genius with wisdom, but you can, you would, if, but in our culture, we don't have, we don't think it has any relationship to ethics. So you could go home and beat up your husband every day and still be neurotic and berserk. That's not surprising to us. Well, from the Buddhist perspective, the wisdom he is talking about is also technological wisdom. Brilliant. I mean, the wisdom you need to realize emptiness is incredibly sophisticated. But the wisdom the Buddha is talking about, it is not wisdom. It was only in the head. It's just, a, it's just a bunch of intellectual knowledge. It has to touch your heart. It has to be linked to ethics. So when you've got wisdom in Buddhism, by definition, you have got ethics and you, are, you have placated your mind. You're giving up delusions because delusions are ignorance. So by giving up delusions, one, you get wisdom, but two, you become sane and, and compassionate and unneurotic. So wisdom and ethics are utterly inextricably linked. So Lama could see very well that, you know, you could go off and become a translator, go off and become a, a brilliant professor. But if it doesn't touch your heart, if you don't study, it's wasting your life. You've got a head full of garbage. It's like learning all these cake recipes and then says, someone says, can you make me a cake, please? Oh, no, I can't do that. People would laugh at you or knowing all the intellectual knowledge about music, but not even knowing how to play one note. It's possible. And that knowledge is still knowledge. But you know, if you don't practice it, it is useless knowledge. That's the Buddha's approach. So he said, he would often scoff and say, I don't care you translate. When I, I'm shocked when my students become translators, they then become intellectual, you know, and arrogant. So, so and this is the lamb rim then is taking the essential points from all this vast body of intellectual knowledge about reality and and enabling us to turn it into experience. That's the unique characteristic of this lamb rim. So okay. There's different levels of practice. And so often I'm, I'm always referring to this. So to really get it essential, the essential point of the first scope of practice, I like to call junior school, the essential point is to control your body and speech. This experientially is where you learn to discipline and to subdue the servants of your mind. The, set, the essence of the second level of practice, high school, the middle scope, is you control your mind. The culmination of junior school and high school, the wisdom wing, is if you leave it there and graduate, you'd achieve your own nirvana. You'd abide by the laws of karma, junior school, you'd take refuge, you'd then into the next level, you go to the next level, you'd get to know your mind, you'd learn meditation, you'd get concentration, you unpack and unravel the delusions, and eventually you'd unpack and unravel the, mis the grossest, the deepest misconception of ego grasping, you'd realize emptiness, and then one life or other, you are out of here, baby, you won't come back. But if you're going to continue on to the compassion wing to university level, the essence of that is compassion and empathy for others. This is the absolute essentials of each of these stages of practice.
the two, the two wings of the bird. Junior school and high school are the wisdom wing, compassion wing is university level. Then you've got postgraduate, which is like a speedy method to get enlightened quickly. Very sophisticated methods. Okay, so when Lama Zabrimshi started teaching the hippies, you know, back in Kopan Monastery in the late, early, very early 70s, his first point was he'd start to teach about the mind, as we did with module one, because for the reason I said. So the very first point we let's look at is the presentation of what the mind is. I'll just say each of the points in these scopes, I'll say each of the points, really roughly, each of these points of this lamb rim from, from beginning to end, and then over the four weeks, we're going to cover them, okay? So in the first, in the very first preliminary thing you learn, you learn about the mind and it's beginningless and it's potential that you can become Buddha and that mind is not physical, mind is beginningless. And we're going to go into that discussion. We'll go into that discussion. That's the very first thing we study in this lamb rim. Now, the next one is, and this comes from Tsongkhapa in the 14th century, he added like a preliminary contemplation to do that he felt was really important, which again is weird for us Westerners, is uh, the necessity to have a good teacher. Guru devotion, they call it. So that would be the next piece we would do. Then the next piece is taking from Atisha. He says, before you even enter into the path, these are like preliminary contemplations, preliminary contemplations to prime your mind ready to enter into the path. And these are the preliminary. So the third preliminary point, which we'll go through, is to, to contemplate and to learn to appreciate the preciousness of this human life. There's a whole series of points there which we'll discuss. So th this is now psychologically, the energy that a teacher wants us to get from this is the conclusion, the action point from the precious, as we all know that this little bullet point is called the precious human rebirth, perfect human rebirth. And you know all the things that they talk about. We'll go into this. But the conclusion, the action point, there's always an action point from each of these. The action point from this one is to think, wow, I cannot believe it. I do not want to waste this precious life. If I compare, it's like a comparison. We'll go through it all. Not, I'm just giving you the points now. We go through it all and you would then think about how amazing this life is, how fortunate you are. If you compare from 99% of the other, the rest of the world, just tick all the boxes. You've got reasonable access to teachings, reasonable this, you've got a whole bunch of good things. Your conclusion, the action point is, I'm not going to go into the details yet. We'll start that soon. Is I don't want to waste this life. That's the action point. I don't want to waste this precious life. Now you're ready to enter into the path. And so the first point in junior school, now your next point is Buddha gets us to think about impermanence, particularly death. And you think, what a weird thing to start with. This is junior school. What are you talking about? Scare the life out of me. What do I talk about death for? Because his, his agenda, a teacher's agenda, is given that you're talking about this precious human life, then he, you go to the next one, you enter into the path, you start to think about impermanence. We're going to go into all this. And what's the action point there? Well, you increase your wish not to waste his precious life. My God, I could die at any moment. So you just, he's energizing us to be inspired not to waste his precious life. That's, that's his agenda behind these points. So then you go to the next point. And now this is one that always scares the life out of all the Westerners. He then talks about, given that you will die, yes, you've got a precious human life, but now you realize it can end at any moment. Now you start to think of the likely possibilities of the types of rebirths you could get. And he scares the life out of you about telling you you'd be born in the hell realms, you'd be born in the spirits, you'd be born as an animal. And he says 99% of all sentient beings are in these realms. And then the, the logic behind this, his agenda is to even increase our wish not to waste his precious life. You mean my life is precious. I don't want to waste it. I could die at any moment. And then when I do die, you mean I could go to a hell realm? Thanks a lot, mate. I mean, this would be uproar. When Lama Zopa was teaching his courses in Kopan, some of the courses are famous because there was a one-month course. And then Lama Zopa sometimes would spend three of the four weeks on one level of the hell realms, giving details. And it was like insanity for these poor hippies. I mean, you could not believe such nonsense. We, there'd be absolute uproar, you know. This is the logic of these, the way these points are made in this framework, you know. We'll discuss all this. We'll go into it, I promise. But this is the logic behind it. The agenda is to increase our wish. So by the time you realize your life's precious, you could die at any moment and you could go to the hell realms or a dog realm or some other and you completely piss your life down the toilet, excuse me, swearing. You think, oh my God, what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do? Quick, whom can I turn to? To give me methods to stop this nonsense. That's the logic behind this. So then you think, well, whom can I turn to? The Buddha. So you take refuge. 
and you think about the Buddha, what a Buddha is. Who is a Buddha? How do you check up on him? You do all your homework. You check up. Do your due diligence? What is the Buddha? What his teachings are? Blah, blah. Then you make a decision. I'd better start putting my money where my mouth is and starting to practice. And this is the, this is the culmination of junior school. And it's the actual essence of the whole of junior school. Now you begin to practice. So all these previous points are just to prime your mind to get you to want to practice, which is now you abide by the laws of karma. That's what we're going to present in detail, all the things about karma, what it is, this concept, continuity of consciousness, everything we think and do and say brings results, blah, 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 you know. That's where you, put, you begin to put your money where your mouth is. Now, if you got that far, this is the, the culmination of junior school. If you got that far, if you stop there, you'd be fine, Buddha says, because you're going to make sure you stop creating causes for future suffering. You stop harming, stop killing, stop lying, because they're the methods, because that's what causes future suffering. So you're going to continue to get a nice, decent human rebirth with decent human conditions so you can carry on. But you can do more. You can go to high school. Now you go to the next scope. And now because you've subdued your body, speech, and mind, your body and speech, you've harnessed your crazy energy, you've disciplined your, your body and speech, you live in vows, you don't kill, you don't steal, because that's going to produce your future suffering. You're more subdued now. Now you can get to the root of the problem. You get to the next level of practice. And here you study the Four Noble Truths. You go into more depth about what suffering is, what its causes are. And you in particular learn about attachment which is effectively the main cause of our suffering. You learn to unpack and unravel the mind here and you now really become your own therapist. You really get to the root of the problem. And the, the, so if you graduated here, like I said before, you'd realize emptiness and get the hell out of here, not come back. But here, if you're moving on to the next wing, compassion wing, you would get renunciation. You'd give up suffering and its causes. And as Lama Zopa says, you've got renunciation when just the thought of another moment of attachment is so disgusting. It's like being in a septic tank. So the second level of practice where you really start to work on your mind, this is where you actually become a Buddhist. The other part is like, is just, you know, it's really the essence of the first scope. The essence of it is to be, behave nicely. And your grandmother will do that. A good communist would behave nicely. The logic for it, of course, is different. So in this, in this, we present perfect human rebirth, death and impermanence, the lower realms, all this blah, blah, blah. That's the Buddhist approach to it. But the essence of junior school is you abide by the laws of karma. You behave nicely. You practice ethics. And the, and the difference is this, though, for the Buddhist logic, the reason you're going to behave nicely is because you don't want future suffering, because you create your own suffering. The next level, you really start to be become your own therapist. This is where you actually become a Buddhist. This is unique to the Buddha, the view about the mind, what it is, how it functions, how you unpack and unravel the mind, how you identify the delusions which cause you suffering, how you distinguish between those and the virtues. This is the nitty gritty of really becoming a Buddhist. And like I said, if you graduated high school, you'd achieve your own nirvana eventually. But here you get renunciation of suffering and its causes. Now you go to the compassion wing and now you start to realize, my God, we're all in the same boat. And you continue to work on your mind that never ceases between here and Buddhahood. But now it is it in reference to breaking down the barriers between self and other. So you do all the compassion wing, accomplishing body teacher, then doing the six perfections of the bodhisattva. And then finally realizing emptiness and now you become a buddha that's the essence of the lamb rim those points so that every word you hear about in the buddha's teachings karma impermanence refuge lower realms bodhicitta love compassion delusions four noble truths you know all of it's covered in orderly way in this packaging So over these four weeks, we're going to be doing that, covering these points. And all the modules are just taking each of these points and presenting them, you know, separately. But this is to give us the overview. I found myself when I first heard the teachings, you know, I didn't have a clue what Lama Zopa was saying. I heard his words, but I couldn't get a handle on it. I couldn't get a big picture. It takes a while. Even when I became a nun, I started working for Wisdom Publications when we were based in London, like in the late 70s. I still, I, mean, I even began to edit some of the Lam Rim books. I still didn't have a clue where it was coming from because it's this Tibetan way of presenting things, 14th century, basically, you know. It takes a while to hear it psychologically, to hear it experientially, to hear it in our own and able to express it in our own language, to get the essence of the meaning of it. It just takes time. But when we can, 
it really helps you because then you can see the whole path you get the whole picture of the path you know so then it's and it's an interesting point they often say this and i know when i first heard this i didn't know what they were talking about but now i understand a bit so let's say you're studying math and you've got a big fat book of maths and there's all the grades in it grade one up to grade 27 just joke you know just say and if you know even a little bit of math every, any page you open you'd be able to know roughly the that's more advanced than i am and you're or another page oh no that i've already done that you would know where you are at and you would know when you read that page oh that's grade 17 that's grade 19 that's grade four you would have a vision of the entire path it's like a map you know where you are on the map and you would know where the other pieces fit so if you open up any buddhist book you read the word karma you would know exactly that's junior school that's first scope you read the word refuge you know that's in the it fits there you read the word bodhicitta you know where it fits you need the word emptiness you know where it fits you need that you need, read the word animal realm you know where it fits exactly the same as any body of knowledge and once you get the bigger picture it's really it makes it a lot easier otherwise you're just kind of blindly following this map and you have got no idea where all the bits fit you know but this takes time i found it really took time which is why when i present the lamb room i try to keep it very simple to get the essence of it and then of course you've got to unpack it and then and then deepen your knowledge as you keep studying if you choose to keep studying and then you would go off and study the original sources for all of this knowledge in the lamb room because all of it is in the in the philosophical teachings that they study in depth in the monasteries you know you'll find the source of every topic in the lamb rim in one of those original sources going right back to the indians i hope we're communicating so i think i need i'm just as a general overview so i need you to ask me some questions now in relation to exactly what i'm talking about the whole the big picture if you have any questions otherwise we can start yeah. yes Samuel. Samuel. yes <laughs> i have a question it's not only about I, i'm sorry what it's not holy what not only about the dharma you need to get closer to the mic i can't hear you so well i'm sorry only about buddhism oh what is it then, oh, what is it then? Okay. uh how do you know what is a valid body of knowledge what are the criteria in general i think you can yeah. answer that yourself no no i I'm mean, no no i i hear you samuel was a very good question well, I mean, you've got to start somewhere. So let's say you hear about mathematics. Let's say you hear about a body of knowledge called mathematics. Well, you tell me what is the process you would go through to become confident that you will study a body of knowledge that's valid. Tell me the process you'd go through, Samuel. What would you do? I... I, yeah, I can only sort of guess because it's really not clear to me. But what would you do if you wanted to learn math? I, I think it is clear to you, but you're making it maybe more complicated. How would you go about studying math or music or any body of knowledge? What other steps you would have to go through to get to the point where you would commit to studying with that teacher, that university, or whatever it might be, what would the steps be that you would have to go through? Well, maybe, maybe I would first see that this person can produce some results. Maybe well, you, no, that's, no, no, that's too much already. That's too advanced. You can't, mm -hmm. you, you know, you'd have to first, okay, you'd have to first check up on the reputation of this person what is their expertise what are they reputed to be you check their students you surely would first have to do that let's say it's a musician there's millions of musicians out there you've got to have enough confidence if you're going to sign up for a five-year course in music you've got to have enough confidence that this is a valid course you can't prove the music is valid experientially until you play it, but you've got to have confidence first intellectually that that course is valid, that teacher is valid, so that you just have to use your common sense, ask around. 
talk to people look up on the thing talk to look at the look at the look at the reputation of this professor or whatever see if they've got valid credentials look at the students surely you must do this you've got to go one step at a time so here it's not that easy you've got to check up on who the hell the buddha is and then you've got to look obviously because buddha's dead You've got to look at the people who teach it. So the trouble is, there's millions of people around the world who teach Buddhism, and I guarantee plenty would be rubbish. So you've really got to check very carefully what you think a Buddhist center is. Is it valid? What are the, who are the teachers these days who are said to be valid? You've got to start with that, at least with a person who is expressing those teachings. So my sense is when people ask what books to read, where do I start? Well, it seems to me if anybody uses a half a brain, you're going to find out that someone like the Dalai Lama looks like he's probably one of the good people. It would seem like from reputation over the last 50 years of being around the West, hundreds of books published, thousands of students, you might, you know, start with him. And then you go from there, you track it one step at a time. And you, what else? There's no other way to do it, Samuel. But uh, with music, for example, I don't have doubts about the validity of the body of music in a whole. If I can give excuse another me, what, excuse me, I don't believe you. What do you mean you don't have doubts? You have to, if you've never heard of music before, you have to look into it. First, you must check up. That teacher, you've got to forget about Bach. Bach's dead. You've got to mm-hmm. check up on a real living human being right now who can teach you how to play Bach. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, you, can, you know, you can read all the Buddhist texts. It's a bit complicated. You've got to find a living being in front of you who embodies this knowledge. That's the piece I'm talking about. Yeah, you should check up on Buddha first to see if you like what you hear. But then you find a person now who is an engineer, who is a musician, who is a, a Buddhist. And then you go one step at a time, checking things as you go, proving each step of the way as you go quietly slowly but like all bodies of knowledge when you enter into it you're taking it as your working hypothesis aren't you you have to do that you see we don't have this level of rigor we think religion anybody can believe anything they like and we're lazy intellectually lazy and we'll sit we'll go to one class oh wow he's so amazing he must be a buddha and then we discover he's a peanut we're ch- we're like children we don't use our intelligence you know Are we communicating, Samuel? How do you check up a different culture? What are you talking about? Tibetan culture? We're talking about people. I don't care about Tibetan culture, Samuel. I'm talking about a person who embodies Mm -hmm. that knowledge. I'm talking about a teacher of that knowledge. Culture is not the point. You know, there's not that. Culture is a big phrase, you know? Mm-hmm. It's the person. I mean, if we've got enough intelligence to read Buddha back in Indian Indian stuff and read all that incredible body of knowledge, it's kind of mind-blowing. It'd be too difficult for most of us. We're not that qualified. So we've got mm-hmm. to find a person now who's a real person, whether they're Tibetan, Israeli, or Australian, who seems mm-hmm. like they're valid. All we can do, surely, is that. And then as we pr- progress, we, we internalize the knowledge as we go, we get more confidence, we can start making our own choices about other teachers. It's like any, I just think it's exactly the same as any, anything you would do to learn, even to learn how to make a cake, you know? What do you well, think? Well, maybe the issue is that I'm confused in general how to learn, what is the process of it? Maybe that's the issue, frankly. But uh, what is it that you want to learn? What are you talking about? Well, for example, if there is a body such as take homeopathy, and I'm not sure if it is valid, if it's a valid body of medicine or not. So how do I check that, for example? I've just given you the answer, Samuel. I'm so sorry to be okay. depressed. I've just so I'll think you. about it more. I've told you exactly, and I think you would agree with it. You tell mm-hmm. me what would you do. You'd go start researching homeopaths. Samuel, what else is available to you? What else can you do? There's no other choice. It's not complicated. You're making it too grand. How do I choose? How do I check a culture? I don't need to know about Chinese culture to understand acupuncture. I need to find a person who is valid. Mm-hmm. Is this not clear? It's too much to expect otherwise. If you didn't have any person in front of you, listen to this, if you couldn't find a single musician who could play mm-hmm. Bach, I would tell you it would be very hard to prove that Bach is valid. 
Mm -hmm. You have to have, because we're not that intelligent. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. for you to go and go back to Bach and study all his music yourself on your own mm -hmm. is too much to expect. You, got, you start with a person who has that knowledge. You do your due diligence. You, that's how we learn everything in the whole world mm -hmm. since we started with one plus one is two, Samuel. Mm -hmm. We learned it from another person. And if we don't check up, then we're going to learn things wrongly. That's why you do your due diligence. I can even remember very vividly when I studied martial arts. At a certain mm -hmm. point in the 70s, I chose this particular place when I was in New York. For, and I chose this place for different reasons, not for the right reason. It, it doesn't matter what the reasons were, but I studied for like two years with this particular teacher and I didn't check properly. So I learned wrongly for two years. Then I went back home to Australia and I went to this a similar club with a similar style and I told them what belt I was. I went into that belt and then he told me at the end, the teacher, and I was really offended. He said, I'm sorry, you've, you, you're not, you've got to go back to the basics. You've got to go back to the white belt. And I was really insulted, but then I realized I hadn't checked the teacher properly. It was a big lesson for me. So Buddhism, spiritual practice, especially, I mean, homeopathy, can you imagine if you like some go, some guy, there are so many frauds around who says they're a homeopath. People even pretend to be surgeons and they even get jobs because people don't check up. There are so many frauds around. I mean, I know a person in America, in California, who says he's a Buddhist monk, who has a Buddhist center, who's got a nice voice, who says what sounds like nice Buddhist things. He is a mentally ill, deluded psychopath when I start to check up on him, when he asked me to come and teach at his center because he's completely delusional. Every word he says is a lie. Everything out of his mouth, he's demented, mentally ill, but he's got many people who like him. And even though the evidence is he's a crazy guy, they still like him. So humans are pretty stupid people because we base it all on emotion, you know? Mm -hmm. We've got to use our intelligence, Samuel, and be humble and go one step at a time. I mean, look at the research people do just to join a university. In America, the families go all over the country checking everything in each university before they have their child go and check up for a three-year course at a dumb university. Look at the due diligence we do in the research, you know, so we don't waste our time and money, you know. It's common sense, Samuel. Okay. Do you think... What I'm saying makes sense. Yeah, uh, it makes sense. I don't want to make too much of everyone's no, time. No, excuse me, Samuel. It's not personal. You, this is an exactly appropriate point. This is a really crucial point. You're the one who's bringing it up. That's all. So your point is you have got to decide what you want, Samuel. In the end, you have to decide. You have to decide what you want. You have to decide that. You've got to keep doing, if you're not clear, if it's Tibetan Buddhism, if it's Zen Buddhism, if it's Christianity, if it's, it's Islam, God knows what, communism, I don't care. You've got to be clear. So you just have to keep searching, keep checking, keep looking and go one step at a time. You know, There's no other choice, Samuel. We can't just believe what other people tell us. We can't just leap in and cross our fingers. You've got to trust your own wisdom one step at a time, Samuel. Are we communicating? Okay. We don't. Um, yes, but uh, I really don't want to take everyone's time, so I'll think of it. Tomorrow. As I said, it's, an important, it's not personal, so keep asking okay. questions. So, yeah, so if so, then I'll ask. Uh, with music, I can see that this person plays the piano. No, you cannot music. see that. No, I disagree with you. I disagree. Some people can have very clever, but they mightn't have much enough knowledge. You, 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 you keep saying the same thing. You've got to do your due diligence, even on that musician. I mean, okay, it's the same example. Have you ever read a book by the Dalai Lama? Have you looked at the Dalai Lama? Have you been to talks about the Dalai Lama? Would you say on the face of it, like you would with a musician, he looks like he's a bit sort of, maybe he's done something. Would you, yeah. would you even be able to say that much? Yes, yes. Well, good, that's yes. a good start. Then. It's a good start. So check up. So if you can prove a little bit from his experience, his, his reputation, what other people say about him, what other musicians say about that musician. One musician, you might go to a concert and be very moved, but then you start doing your research and 17 other people who are said to be good will say, no, no, he's a fraud. So if you can neck up the Dalai Lama and then see every Buddhist teacher that you can read about on the bloody planet will tell you that, yeah, he's the, he's the, he's the real deal. Well, you can get some confidence now. You, you've got to use, you, you, there's no, you can't prove it experientially yet because you haven't got the knowledge. So you've got to rely on others. And this is called intellectual certainty. Still be careful. 
but check up. All we can do is do this. There is no other method, Samuel. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Yeah, that helped. That Good. Helped. I'm very happy. Thank you for it. Okay. Thank you. So, Thank so you. helpful. It's so helpful for everybody. Don't you worry, Samuel. It's great. Okay. okay. What else, then, people? It's a really good point, I tell you. Yes, I'm looking. Any questions or in the chat box? I don't see any. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, okay. So let's start on these points then. Let's start on these points, the bullet point. I mean, the points of this lamb rim. Okay, the first one is the mind. We've discussed it already, but now I'm going to go into it. So let's just look at the bullet points. What is the starting point is the mind. Why? Because that's what becomes a Buddha. The end result of all this is Buddha, free of all the delusions, full of all the wisdom and full of all the wisdom and virtue. So the, if this is the goal, we'd better know what the mind is, you know. So mind is not physical. Mind is synonymous with the word consciousness. Mind is not a function of the brain, although it works intimately with the brain. Mind is not, the biggest one is mind is not the handiwork of another person. This is a major point, and we just need to think about this, trying to see the logic of it, because there is logic for it, you know. But, you know, we utterly believe that there's a piece of us called a soul, for example, that comes from a creator. Or if we're materialists, we absolutely do know, we know, not believe, we know we get our brain from our mother and father. But the point there is we think the mind is the brain. That's the difference. But the Buddha's view is, of course, you get the brain from your mother and father. Yes, you get the genes. All the physical bits come from your mommy and daddy. No argument. But your mind this is the fundamental point. The mind is not physical, is not a function of the brain. So then we think, well, if that's the case, where does my mind come from? It's a very logical question. So the way to think about this is a really good, it's like a meditation to do, actually. The way to think about this, this is, this is um, the Buddha's view about cause and effect. I mean, we're going to, when you really study this philosophically, it goes into great detail. That you know, the, the key thing here is that if we think of our mind, the word mind is referring to our thoughts, our feelings, emotions unconscious, subconscious, at the subtlest level of our cognitive capacity. So the way they use, the term they use in Buddhist um, psychology is mental continuum. It's like basically our mind is a river of mental moments. Don't think of it as a thing in the brain, a thing in the skull, a, a thing, you know, that you can find bits of. It's a continuity of moments. So this moment of my capacity for cognition in this river of mental moments. Think of it as a river of mental moments. So this moment of my capacity for cognition, that's my mind, what's its main cause? The very millisecond of my cognition just before that. And what was the main cause of that moment of cognition? The very millisecond of cognition before that. And what, and what was the cause of that? The, the moment before that. And what was the cause of that? The moment before that. And it's a really good kind of meditation to do because you can track your mind in an unbroken chain of mental moments and you inexorably will not miss a single moment. You can't say that between five past 10 and 10 past 10 this morning, my mind didn't exist. You can't say that because if your mind ended utterly ended, they can never continue again. It can't just pick up where it left off. So your mind is an unbroken chain of mental moments of cognition. Unbroken, millisecond by millisecond. And if you tracked it back enough, you could, you know, inexorably, you will get back to your, when you were in your mother's womb at the time of conception. Because each second, you have to go back to the previous moment of cognition. The main cause of this moment of cognition, the previous moment. And you get to the moment when you came out your mummy's womb and there's a little baby crying. So we know there's a consciousness there. So the consciousness in that body, where did it come from? The previous moment. Where did that come from? The previous moment. It's like a chain, unbroken chain, links in a chain. It's a really good way to think and it's not illogical. So then you get back to the first second of conception. So if you're a Christian, God puts a soul in there and that's how you begin. So you can track yourself back to God if you like. If you're a materialist, which is the prevailing view in our society these days, you track yourself back to your mother and father's egg and sperm. Your egg and sperm, yes, produces the body. There's no argument there. Buddha does not argue with that. 
but the consciousness it's got its own continuity you check back the first second of conception your mind you go back to a previous moment of that same continuity of mind and a few weeks before that you will find it was in a previous body this is all in the in the, in the buddhist literature and where, so where did i begin maybe in a previous life no because you track it back in the same way and this is the point you keep tracking so we desperately want to get back to the first moment we always ask when did it begin even in our problems psychologically we go to our therapist and we keep digging back into our past in this life we're kind of thinking we'll get back aha that's when it happened we want a first moment very badly now the buddha would say out of interest philosophically this first moment if you're a christian you call it god you know so we all come from god no such concept in buddhism you come back from the previous moment of your own continuity of consciousness and you keep going back desperately wanting a first moment that's irrational buddha says that's coming from the delusions in our mind that assumes there must be a first moment that's complete contradiction to the logic of cause and effect cause and effect by definition is that each millisecond of whatever it is that's existing at this moment physical or mental it if it exists at this moment we can deduce it came from a previous moment that's why Dalai Lama in all his conversations with the scientists you know he joked big bang no problem just not the first big bang that's all so matter and minds the Buddhist philosophical view is that both are beginningless you cannot possibly posit a something anything that didn't have a previous moment impossible not logical not feasible not possible this is a really good thing to think about i tell you that's a great meditation to do the beginninglessness of this mind as nutty as it sounds to us it seems so irrational to us but it's only irrational because we have a view so strongly that there must be a first moment we just assume it we've never questioned it so it sounds ridiculous to question it this is the buddha's logic you know and where does this information come from the buddha's own observation where does one plus two come from somebody's observation not pluck it out of the sky as an interesting belief it's coming from the buddha's observation every word in buddhism if it is valid is coming from the direct experience of a buddha necessarily that's why if you can prove a buddha wrong then you must reject him so mind is not physical is beginningless and is not the handiwork of mummy daddy or a creator and this point alone is just tremendous the implications of this experientially already right at the start here completely shift everything because if my mind is mine and everything in it i put there which is the view of karma which we'll get to then i am the cause of myself as his holiness Dalai Lama calls karma it's self-creation because the law of karma is this natural law that runs within every single mind it's the natural law that minds live within it's the law that it's a natural law nobody made it up nobody runs it this is a crucial point and all this is implied just by this concept of mind it's a massive one and of course you can't prove it immediately of course you can't so you take it as your hypothesis and eventually if you keep working with it you'll come to a conclusion you'll either find the buddha's wrong or he's right there's only two options this is the kind of rigor we need this is something surprising to us we you know, we're very intellectually lazy when it comes to spiritual we'd rather believe in something we're just lazy you know it's not helpful to believe if you get, and if you just believe in something anybody can convince you otherwise you will lose your plot you know because once your faith goes you're lost so your mind is beginningless and endless there's different views in buddhism very different views in buddhism this is a very interesting point but the view that we are studying says the mind is endless you know i know the dalai lama is so sweet he said one time when he heard about it because for example the theravadan view is the the buddhism that exists in india is in thailand is one of the many types of buddhism existing in the world tracking itself back to india that when you've achieved your nirvana 
even just your nirvana. If it, they, they don't posit, they do posit Buddhahood, but not for everybody. But we can all achieve our own nirvana, which is you graduated high school. Once you've achieved your nirvana, then when you die in that life, you are gone. There's not an atom of you left. Nothing, nothing. So that's really nihilism from this Mahayana point of view. I remember the Dalai Lama joked and said, and that's we Mahayanas have a problem with that, he said. It was rather funny. He cracked a joke. So this is a massively interesting point. I mean, I find these points interesting. Some people think they're boring. I don't know what to say. So consciousness, it's mine. It's my mind. It's my mind. I mean, you know, I'm, I say this sometimes and it sounds very hilarious. I say ridiculous things sometimes. I know that. But um, the, the more I work with the Buddhist view and attempt to internalize it, attempt to put my money where my mouth is, attempt to practice it, not just blindly sit on my laurels and believe it, the more I think about it and try to apply it, the more bizarre the idea is that you can come from a creator or your mother and father. The more bizarre it is, the more weird. And I'm not being rude if you have faith in a creator. Please forgive me. I remember my Jesuit friend, we had long discussions about this. How it could be possible that a creator who is utterly perfect can make you, and then you can become dirty again, become naughty again. That's just not feasible for the Buddha. It's not possible. It's impossible. It's impossible. So there's many interesting things here that I find very fascinating to discuss. I like discussing these things. So, so the energy that comes from your mind is beginningless, is that it's yours. And then when you learn about karma, that increases your confidence that you are in charge of who you are. The Dalai Lama calls it self-creation. That's a wonderful way to put it. Because what goes on in your mind is what you put there. Nobody can put anything into your mind. That's the most bizarre concept. That even that your mother can give you music. I mean, my mother was a musician, for example, and she taught her little Bobsy. That's me. So naturally, we'd say, oh, Rabina's good at music because she got the genes from her mummy. Well, no, the Buddha's way of putting it is this. My mother got born in this life with a tendency to play music. I got born in this life with a tendency to play music. Where from? From each of us having played it before. That's how come you, you come programmed into this life with your own tendencies. Your own tendencies. So then my mother, having a little Bobsy, could see her talent or she said I had, so she taught me music. But if I had no tendency to be good at music, my mother could teach me until the cows come home. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to internalize it. So I didn't get music from my mother. She facilitated my potential by teaching me. That's the way to put it. And it's the same with anger. My father might have been angry. Oh, Rabina's angry because her daddy was angry. No. I had a tendency to be angry. I got born with it because of being angry before. My father might have been angry before, so he had a tendency. And then my father being angry at me increased my anger. So we all work together. It's dependent arising. But your mind is yours. And then when you learn about karma, you realize it's contents. It's not possible someone can give you a mind, can give you anger. It's a bizarre idea for the Buddha. And the more we internalize that, the more empowered you become the more empowered you become because your mind is yours and you can turn it. You can, as Lama Zoba says, we can mold our mind into any shape we like, you know. The more we think this is the basis of all the Buddha's teachings that our mind is ours and it's not physical. And then we come into this life programmed with our own past and that everything we think and do and say so seeds in the mind. This is the karmic one, which comes, I don't know, we'll discuss this next week. This is underpinning all of Buddha's teachings. So the knowledge about the mind is vast in Buddhism. And then what you do with that mind to turn you into a Buddha. You know? It's very delicious. I find it, obviously, I find it delicious. That's why I'm a Buddhist. So I don't think I want to talk about any more besides the mind today. It's 15 minutes to go. So see if we have any more questions. So the mm. mind is the starting point. Beginninglessness of mind is the starting point. So really kind of try to think this through. How this moment of mind, what's its main source? The previous moment. And what's the source of that? The previous. So try to think of you get back and say, well, maybe it began then. Then if something existed at that second, whether it's 27 lives ago or a million lives ago, try to think it logically. If it existed at that moment, then it has to have had 
a previous moment. So there cannot be such a thing as an absolute first moment. There can't be, just logically, there can't be. So mm. to think about that is really delicious. So who has a question? Yes, I'm, Nina, sweetheart, go. Um, I find it very difficult to understand and experience the continuity of mind because when I go to sleep, for example, I feel sometimes, of course, I dream, but sometimes it's really completely blank and I feel more like a computer who's shut down. That's right. Sure. And then yes. I, I got energy again. And exactly. Yeah, it's really difficult. Do you have any tips? Of course, that? darling. Absolutely. Because that's where, I mean, I haven't even begun to look at that yet. So let's look at it a bit here. But if we take, you see, from the Vajrayana, have a very the Vajrayana, which is the more advanced teachings, have very detailed descriptions of the different levels of our mind. And this is the whole point here that I haven't even begun to mention, that the way when we say mind in our culture, we are meaning the grosser level of conceptuality and our sensory. And as exactly as you point out, when you go to sleep, you seem to go off, you know, the computer turns off. Well, honey, we've got gross consciousness, which is our sensory related to this gross body. But then we've got this subtler level of consciousness, which we also access, which is our mental consciousness, our, our thoughts and feelings and emotions. So that's subtle consciousness. And that's also inextricably linked to a subtler level of physicality that's described in detail in the Vajrayana. And that's the level of mind that dreams. That's our subtle mind. And then we've even got subtler levels of mind that we virtually never access, but they're all available to us when we start to really get brilliant at meditation, when we start to go to a more subtle levels. And in the long term, we absolutely have to go to these subtler levels of cognition in order to do the job of becoming a Buddha. So there's this much subtler levels of mind. And this is coming from the Indians. Forget about even Tantra. That's one of the fundamental findings of all the Indian great scholars and yogis from their own direct experience through meditation that we can access these much subtler levels of mind and we don't posit these as existing at all in our modern psychological models and neuroscientific models and then um can we come biting or what would be the the good method to do that well, calm abiding that's right exactly what it is yeah exactly that's taught i mean that really is taught in depth in the lamb rim towards the end of the practice but that's actually we can start that anytime we like absolutely calm abiding is this brilliant technique these indians invented that enables us to go to these subtle levels of mind that is like science fiction for us because we don't posit them you know we absolutely in the long term we have to access the subtle levels so this is the other major point about Buddhism. We've got these subtle levels of cognition, and they're deeply described in all the texts, including, including in just in Karma Viding. I mean, in Lama Yeshi's Mahamudra book, he talks about some of the qualities we would have if we accomplished Karma Viding. And for us, in ordinary psychological terms, it sounds like science fiction. It sounds insane. And this is just not even, forget Tantra, this is just in the ordinary sutra teaching. And that even came from the Hindus. It's not even Buddhist. Karma Viding is made up by these invented created, perfected by these genius Indian yogis, you know, more than 3000 years ago. So this is the part that is really opens your mind up to really understanding consciousness, because when you're at that level of mind, Nina, you, 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 you'd see no brain activity at all. You'd look like you were dead. That's why these subtle levels of mind do not depend upon the brain. And that's why this is the basis of a lot of the discussions the last 30, 40 years with His Holiness and so many of the best brains in the West, lots of things. And they're all really so, you know, many, for example, Dalai Lama jokes about all his scientific friends. You know, for example, there's all these, as we know, these stories about the great yogis who die with complete control and they stay in meditation sometimes for hours or even days or even weeks, but they look like they're dead. And so there's these, these, these scientific, scientific friends are creating these machines they can put on the brains or whatever of these so-called dead yogis trying to find evidence of subtler consciousness. So it's wonderful that people are looking into these things and taking it seriously. You understand, Nina? Yeah, thanks. Good. Okay, great. Thank you so much. What else, dearest people? Questions about the mind? Okay. Yes, welcome. Yes, welcome. Hello, Venerable Rubina. Could I please yes. ask you again of the Buddhist definition of wisdom versus knowledge? Good. Right. Yes, it's good really point. very, very interesting. No, exactly. Well, it's even interesting in Tibetan. There's two different words, I think. For, for knowledge, it's called it's called sherab. She, S H E R A B, Sherab. And then wisdom, they call it transcendental wisdom, which is the wisdom that realizes emptiness, the highest level of your wisdom. That's called Yeshe, 
like in Lama Yeshe, Yeshe. So actual, I mean, broadly speaking, wisdom, speaking simply, wisdom is simply being accurate. But there are levels of wisdom. So ordinary knowledge, having Sherab, you've got a sharp mind, you learn things properly. It's like conventional wisdom. But when you've got the wisdom that realizes emptiness, which is the subtlest level of your mind, that's called transcendental wisdom. And that's finally the wisdom of a Buddha. When you see things at all levels, you see reality as it is, including ultimately. You understand? Yes. And, and I also find it very interesting. You talk a lot of about wisdom and compassion. And yeah. it, it's interesting for me that, that compassion in Buddhism is represented with a masculine energy, with, with no, I know, Avalokiteshvara. No, I know, we, it's kind of curious. I know. Yeah, no, no, there, yeah. are, there are female ones as well. But even typically, when they talk about in Tantra, they talk about wisdom and method. Generally, the two wings are wisdom and method. And the wisdom is often considered to be female. It's female, and that's represented by the bell and method, which often is either bliss in tantra or compassion. That's often seen as the as the as the male aspect. So I know it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And and, and why suddenly wisdom feminine? Yes, wisdom is said to be feminine. Yeah, yeah. And and nowadays we we don't bring this together. Nowadays we really think wisdom is masculine in the and Western world. No, I understand. No, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, so wisdom is sort of, yeah, it's seen as, you know. It, it's it's I, exactly it, vice versa. Uh, and, and, and in yeah, the no, Western world, we think that compassion is very female. feminine. No, yeah. I know exactly. You know, it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? I know it's yeah. very curious. It's, it really is another take on it. It's yeah. interesting to see it, yeah. isn't it? I agree and, with you. And, agree. and do, you, do you have any idea why, why it's exactly vice versa? I don't know why. I mean, this is very old. This is coming from India yeah. way back. This is way back. Always has been depicted like this. It's very curious, isn't it? Yeah. It's very curious. Because you see, the wisdom one is not the intellectual wisdom, but wisdom is often depicted as female and female in the sense that it's quick, no nonsense, sharp, cut through the obstacles. It's sharp and intuitive. When it's really intuitive wisdom, that's a real female quality. So that is not contradictory for the way we think about it. Not wisdom meaning it knowing a lot of things, but intuitive, sharp, very quick and very fluid. Do you understand? That's the wisdom we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I have to think about it. I have to turn exactly, compliment. Exactly. Thank you very much. That's really good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, darling people, a few more minutes to go. Anything more there, Tara? Yeah, I'm not seeing any chat box, anyone out there who's scrolling. Okay, so then I, I recommend with the mind one, just, I mean, the, the mind one about this, uh, you know, beginningless business is kind of interesting because that is the Buddha's experiential findings. But, and, but I think to think about it logically, if you, if you think there's a first, an absolute first moment that implies that before that first moment, there has to have been nothing. So that's just in the simplest meaning, I think, of the words. That's an utter contradiction. You can't have that. But it's just intuitively, it's so shocking to us. Think about this. To think that your mind is beginningless. It just seems too hilarious for words. It really does, doesn't it? And why is because we don't, I mean, we talk about, it's even too shocking for us to even think that our mind has one previous life. And we say, oh, don't be ridiculous. Who remembers a past life? Well, this is Nina's point about mind. If we go to, we realize we've got subtle levels. When you even just get calm abiding, this, this Hindu technique, you'll get clairvoyance because you've accessed a subtle level of mind and the subtle level of mind can cognize subtler phenomena, which includes the past and the future. This is absolutely what's stated in all the teachings. And the thing is, I mean, we can see we live at a very gross level of mind. We don't remember 99% of today. I mean, it's, it's not even a joke. If we had to sit down and account for every second of what we thought and said and did today, we'd all be utter failures. But this is the potential we have got when we access subtle levels. So just don't use logic because you can't remember something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And then secondly, the shockingest one is beginningless and endless. It just sounds so odd to us, but it's worth thinking about. It's worth thinking about which immediately implies when you track yourself back, you don't track yourself back to mummy, daddy, grandma, grandpa, and the monkeys, nor do you track yourself back to a creator. You track yourself back to yourself in all your countless past lives. It's a very different view, and it's very fascinating. You know? And don't be nervous about it. I mean, Buddha might be wrong. We've got to find out, don't we? So, darling people, this is it. Um, 
and I said, and I said I'd say, I, I talked about to last, last is sort of saying there's an awful lot of study material for those of you who are trying to study the whole thing properly, but don't be nervous, you know, just read things when you feel like it, get the big picture, try to understand it. Every time you listen to it again, every time you read something again, read it casually, study it intensively, learn it slowly and just internalize, internalize intellectually, but experientially and just do your best. And I think we're all so clever. It won't take us long to read books. Don't worry about it. And don't just stuff the books in your head and think, oh, I've read it. Try and read it and make it like a meditation. Read it and try and taste the meaning, you know. And slowly, 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 slowly. And the thing is, when you do start to internalize it, then you get enthusiasm. If you just treat it like intellectual and get nervous and stuff it in your head, you'll get very depressed. You won't want to do it, you know. It's really important. To just to try and taste the meaning of it all, to internalize it, you know. Yes, Miriam. Okay. Hi, Venerable. Last yes. quick question. Do we each have individual minds or is there a source? I think you spoke about it earlier at one point, but is there a source of mind on a subtler level? And then through our karma and our actions, we each kind of branch off into a, our individual minds. No, that's the same. That's the same concept as a, as God. You're tracking yourself back to some fundamental source. There is no view. That's not a possibility in Buddhism. There's no first source, whether it's a consciousness, whether it's universal consciousness, whether it's God, it's all the same concept. It's, just, it's not viable. You, every mind is individual and goes yeah. back to beginningless time to its own individual previous moments. Okay. It doesn't start in one big thing and then branch off. Not like okay. that. Okay. No. Got it. It's a good point. It's a good point, but no. Okay. And if you think it through, it kind of this way of saying it, it kind of makes sense. In other words, the minds are very personal and karma is very personal. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, what's interesting, Miriam, when you become a Buddha and when I become a Buddha and Caroline becomes a Buddha, then if you like, you can say we'll all be the one mind. You will say that then. We'll all got the same knowledge, the same Buddha. The way they say there's only one God, you could argue at the subtlest level of just pure consciousness when you, we've all become a Buddha or you've become a Buddha and I've become a Buddha, we'll be the same Buddha. But there are millions of manifestations in different bodies of those Buddhas. Do you understand? Got it. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, honeys, I mean, there you go. I hope there's something food for thought here. Yes. Thank you, Venerable, for this evening. Uh, and, we would like to do the long life prayer for you be, before you leave. No, no, no. no, you don't need it. We don't need it. The end, mate. Don't worry about it. It's ah. okay. No, we just finish and we just, I want to just do that. Don't do the, you can do the prayers formally yourselves later if you like, but I just feel, think the thoughts, think, okay, hour and a half, we've been sitting here, many thoughts, many seeds we've been planted, be so delighted. And we want to nourish these seeds from the second forward because nothing goes astray so that we can develop our own amazing potential as a Buddha. So we can be a benefit. How amazing. Have some enthusiasm, you know, and then may body teach to grow and grow on the hearts of all and delight. All right, precious ones. And get some enthusiasm. When you've got enthusiasm, you'll be happy. If there's no enthusiasm, you'll be depressed. So eat it, eat it up, taste it, make it, make it try and make it delicious for yourselves. Okay. And that comes a lot from discussion. If you have anybody among you who you like, you can talk to each other. When I was studying in depth, you know, what made it really powerful for me was when I was studying this back in the late 70s. And Lummi Yeshi started his Geshi program and we studied like five days a week. Every evening, straight after teachings, we'd have intensive discussion and it would be often be one on one. And sometimes before we had exams, I'd sit for eight hours with one person who was like, you'd check your people, your friends, you know, and you just go through all the stuff. What was that? What was the definition? What did she say that was? What's this? What was the mind? And you eat it up, for, you eat it, it's delicious. And you get enthusiasm for it. You've got to get enthusiasm. Then it becomes real for you. And don't be nervous about not being intellectual and all that stuff. Don't worry about it. You know. And everything you've heard today, Try and apply it, even in 1% of it in your daily life. Just try and get a way of applying it. Then it becomes real, not just in your head, you know. Okay, precious ones, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Venerable.